Iowa Theme Park Podcast, Episode 8, an exclusive interview with Lost Island's Eric Birch. For those of you joining our podcast for the first time, we invite you to like our page on Facebook, Iowa Theme Park Enthusiasts. From there, you can find our fan group, Lost Island Fans Iowa, where we discuss all things Lost Island. Hey everyone, it's Nick from Iowa Theme Park Enthusiast. Today we are going to be featuring Eric Birch from Waterloo's Lost Island theme park and water park how you doing eric i'm doing well nick thanks for having me thanks again for joining us we really appreciate uh you taking time out of your day to join us and answer some of the lingering questions about the new lost island theme park you guys are opening up this year um it's very exciting time for iowa and we're very much looking forward to this new park opening up so are we we're excited to bring this new project to life and uh share it with everybody uh beyond just in iowa all right and today we have jack you out there yeah i'm right here and i guess now kind of bringing him on as a full-time host we have eden mullen yeah i do do we all right so uh if anybody doesn't have anything we'll start right off with questions i've got the first one here um eric we'd like you to just tell, tell us a little bit about yourself i have uh lived in iowa my whole life and Grew up building cabinets with my dad, and in the uh, late 90s, we took a trip to the Wisconsin Dells, and my dad and grandfather just had an idea of bringing some family entertainment to the Cedar Valley and thought on that vacation that if a place like the Wisconsin Dells could handle multiple water parks, that surely Waterloo could sustain one, and so uh, when I graduated from high school, construction started on the Lost Island Water Park. And uh, after four years at Drake University in Des Moines, I uh, spent a little bit of time uh, working in, in Europe for a semester before coming back and really getting my hands very dirty in the operation of the water park. So went from a lifeguard to the aquatics department manager and then took over front of house years later and then eventually moved on to the general manager position before uh, transitioning out of that role when the theme park started construction into sort of a construction manager role and now I am uh, the acting general manager of that project until we can find someone else to assist us with that. Okay, that's really great. Um, it's great to get to know you and a little bit about uh, the history of how everything got started. It's a really neat thing to learn how we get into the attractions world. Yeah, we, I mean, going to water parks and theme parks was always part of our childhood vacations. And so it was an opportunity to bring those experiences to our neighbors, something that many people in in the Cedar Rally and uh, surrounding areas maybe have never thought of or just don't have the opportunity to go experience elsewhere around the world. And so trying to bring those world-class experiences closer to home. That's great. And I also know that you guys have received many awards. Is that correct with your current water park? We have. Uh, we've been recognized by the USA Today's top 10 water parks in the world, TripAdvisor, we were on their list of top 10 water parks in the United States a few years ago. We consistently are recognized in the community for being one of the the best of the best businesses. And that's all really great. Honestly, the best award is just the responses that we get from guests who are visiting for the first time and their jaw drops open when they walk through the gate because wherever they're from they just don't expect to find something of the at the level of quality that we try to 
uh, provide for people at the water park. And that's what we're hoping to do with the theme park as well. That's great. So after operating the world-class water park for so long, for so many years, what kind of made you make that step into the theme park world and make the decision to branch over there instead of just staying in the water park? Well, similar to uh, the way that you get the roller coaster bug and then any everything you think about is related to amusement parks and rides the same sort of thing happens to operators in the industry once you get into the world of attractions it's kind of hard to get out of it uh it, it really becomes a part of who you are and so once the water park started becoming successful and we noticed sort of a plateau in attendance, we started to turn our thoughts to, well, what what else would bring tourism to the area? Because clearly, because we, we live in a, a smaller population center, it's challenging to wring out more guests from the turnip, so to speak. And so since the, the water park demographic had kind of been exhausted, we played around with some other ideas. So there was an indoor water park resort that made it pretty far into design development before the housing crash in 2007 and eight. So we were fortunate enough to have not pulled the trigger on that because I have a feeling it would have turned out poorly. Uh, but then we looked at trying to bring in an outdoor outfitters that was tied sort of to the KOA that we opened in 2011. That never really panned out. Obviously, we, we, we helped bring the Isle Ca Casino into the area. That was in 2007. And so the plan had always been to create more of a synergistic destination with the water park as kind of an anchor piece. And we had tried all of these other avenues and we're really hoping that we could get some other people interested in creating this destination and maybe assist us with different attractions. And it became clear that other than the casino, that was unlikely. And so uh, through a lot of research, we stumbled on some pretty compelling statistics that pointed at uh, the fact that regardless of the population center that they're located in, dry parks, uh, facilities that have coasters and other, other mechanical rides do far better than water parks in the same demographic area. So whether it's on the East Coast, West Coast, Southeast, in the Orlando area, by hands down across the board, the, the water park attendance was significantly lower than the dry park attendance. And you can surmise that that's due to a number of factors. There, there's obviously a, a pretty large percentage of the population that maybe feel more comfortable in clothes than swimsuits. And the, the weather is much more forgiving in a dry park as well. You, it doesn't have to be 80 degrees and sunny for you to be having a good time on a roller coaster. Where at the water park, that's, that's kind of the, it's a very small Goldilocks zone. And so it was uh, around 2010 or 11 that we decided that the, the best way to bring in some new tourism to the area was with a, a dry park of some sort. And uh, similar with the idea behind the water park being heavily themed, we felt that a heavily themed amusement park would differentiate us from a number of the competitors that are nearby because our budget is certainly limited. We're, we're not a Disney or Palace Entertainment that has incredibly deep pockets. And so we felt that there was a, a niche uh, in the themed entertainment world that isn't being fulfilled by 
a lot of the other facilities in uh, in an easy driving radius. So the focus really turned towards let's create an experience as opposed to trying to erect the tallest, fastest, uh, most extreme, most inversion coasters because not only is that going to be outdone probably in the next year, it's also going to mean that we'll only be able to have three rides in the whole park. And uh, it's more about building a, a full day experience. And so we started on this journey to create the first theme park in the Midwest that hopefully will live up to the hype and transport people the same way the water park does into a place that is wildly different than the Midwest. That is really great to hear. I think you touched on that extremely well. Um, I would agree on all of those points. And especially, you know, when you say when you're in the theme park, you know, you grew up going to theme parks and now you're operating one. You know, I, I grew up going to them and this is why I'm so involved with them like I am today because it's something I'm very passionate about. So it's and it's great to hear. Um, we're really excited about how you're going about the theming. I, I certainly myself have been seeing all the updates on the Facebook page where just the attention to detail is is something I've never seen. And to see that from a private investment standpoint, I think you guys are doing a really great job. So well, thank you. That moves me on to the next question. Could you tell us a little bit how the ride selection process worked? Um, what kind of made you decide for what you did? I know you kind of briefly touched on it with kind of where your budget was and things like that, but what, why, sure. why did you choose the ones you chose? Well, we, we had a lot of help from uh, Bruce Robinson design. They were the design architect that helped us build the water park and they were who we went to when we decided to take on this next project uh so they they helped us a lot in terms of the number of rides that we would need to make it a full day experience as well as the diversity to appeal to a wide range of guests so uh we obviously have a number of children's rides uh situated in in us in its own area to allow families with small kids to not need to walk five miles to make it to each ride that they're able to go on. They come in, they go to the right of the main entrance. They can hang out there for two hours if that's how long the, the kids are willing to stay. And then they can get back out without, you know, the, the kids being done far, long, far sooner than the parents, but them, them still having to walk for ages and ages back to their car. Um, the, the rest of the rides are really, um, we just tried to make sure it was a mix of classic popular rides and also where we could some selections that again are, are not offered in this area. They might not be the tallest, fastest, longest, most inversions, but Looking at the parks in the area, the Six Flags, Adventureland, Valley Fair, were kind of uh, worlds of fun, were our uh, reference points. Th there isn't a launch coaster in any of those facilities. There's also not a suspended looping coaster. And so just providing an opportunity, again, for, for people to experience those rides without having to, in the case of the launch coaster, fly to Sweden or the... Uh, suspended looping coaster obviously those uh, exist in a number of places around the country but not in the midwest and then of course the dark ride too obviously that's that's really our the crown jewel of the park uh, because it is a custom ride by sally dark rides so it's it was tailored to the storyline of the park uh, making it extra special in terms of how it relates to the the overall story that we're we're trying to push with the park and then that is on on a whole nother level in terms of 
a ride experience because of the 3D element and the, the ride vehicle that you're in. There's an interactive component because you're shooting at targets and do, you're able to accumulate a score that can change based on the accuracy of your your shots. So there's a lot of replayability in there. And when when it was released that we were putting in a dark ride, there were a lot of people that had no frame of reference. They were trying to compare it to them. Help me out here. That uh, what did what did Adventureland have? The, the underground is the underground the, their dark ride. Yeah, I'd consider it a dark ride. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely in that dark ride category, but it doesn't have the interactiveness. I don't think it's going to compare, you know, to to what you guys are putting in. And, you know, kind of on your point where you said maybe not a lot of people knew what it was, that's the actual thing. I'm a coaster guy. I love coasters, but that's actually one of the things I'm most excited about your part because I've never really gotten to do one or or ride a, an interactive dark ride. So I'm actually really looking forward to that. Well, I'm glad that you feel that way, Nick, because it's, it is hard to explain without giving everything away. It's so much further along in technology than the underground that, I mean, you're the much closer version. And obviously this is going kind of the other direction with the pendulum, but we're closer to the escape from Hogwarts ride than we are the underground with Volcano Quest for the Golden Idol. But between the animatronics and the 3D wraparound screens that have the interactive shooting elements, it's, it is by far the most unique experience that people in the Midwest will have an opportunity to, to try. I completely agree with that. That is, I'm, I'm like Nick. I'm much more of a coaster kind of guy, but Volcano looks absolutely outstanding. I mean, it stole the floor at Ayapa in, I believe, November was that trade show. Correct. Yeah, and with good reason. Sally, Sally does an amazing job. I mean, they're artists and the lighting designers and and the people that work on the animatronics are all just so passionate about their work and they they've come a long way too they've been doing this for 30 years and they started out building things like you see in chuck the old chuck e cheeses and showbiz and now they they have improved the the movements so much on their their humanoid animatronics and just the the level of realism on the 3D screens is just unbelievable. And I am more than excited for not only that, but the entire park. It just looks great. When we were asking people on the Facebook page what uh, questions they wanted to ask you, I actually asked my own question. Are there any plans already set for future expansions and rides or attractions? Like I know we're just starting out, we're hopefully opening up this summer, but do we already have plans set for more? Or can you explain any of those if they are? Uh, Sure, Eden. Uh, obviously, like so much of this project, we like to keep as much uh, secret as long as we can, just to to make it a surprise and and make it a big splash when we have have things to tell. But uh, what I can tell you is that when you visit the park now, there are three rides that have a themed queue to kind of give you some backstory on the the different realms and the, their history but we have four main realms so there's already plans that uh, were taken out during value engineering for a fourth theme queue ride that will be water themed and we we have space for at least three more major attractions in addition to the rides we also uh, expect to invest heavily in year two and three in entertainment uh, because that was something else that was removed from the phase one due to budget constraints um, so the the immediate answer is that 
we will be focusing on entertainment opportunities first. And then once those have been established, we do have plans for some additional rides, uh, but they will probably not be under construction until fall of 2024. And mm -hmm. they, they may change too. That's the other reason that I don't want to tell you anything and then have people either excited or disappointed that we've changed our mind because a lot can happen in two years and uh, beyond telling you that there will be a theme, a fourth theme queue and uh, we have space for three major rides. That's really all I'm, I'm able to tell you at this point. Well, I appreciate you talking about that, but that is very, very uh, exciting to hear. My pleasure. So um, kind of moving into the much more of listener based questions or whatever, uh, Trevor asks, what are the future possibilities of season passes or two park passes uh, for the parks? The likelihood is certain. Um, currently, we are running into some challenges with our point of sale system that is making it difficult to have the two facilities talk to each other. It's it seems like it should be easy, but for accounting reasons, the businesses are separate and the the point of sale system either wants them to be a single business or they have to be absolutely separate. And so our our intention in year one was to offer uh, multi-day for both parks uh, and a, a single day park hopper. It will be available at the gate, but the intention was that we would have a variety of ticketing options available online. And those, uh, those options are still in the works and will most likely not be available until 2023. And the reason for the season pass uh, moratorium, I guess you would say for this year is because we really don't know when we plan to open. The last thing we would wanna do is pre-sell season passes or even sell them the day that we open at a an advertised price and then have people disappointed because of the length of season whether that's because we open late or need to close early there's a real concern that we will have a challenge finding enough help to operate the facility and so until we have the operation down and we know what what guests should expect we would just prefer to make it easier on everyone and uh, set expectations low so that we can beat them in the future I think that's an incredible way to go about that you know being trying to be transparent and and open and honest and really take your guests potential concerns into consideration that's that's really good well thank you I'm glad that you see it that way we we have had a number of people that are that are disappointed with that information, but we really feel that it's in in everyone's best interest based on the information that we have to I mean it it just ends up being a hassle if we sell season passes and say, yep, we're going to be open on May 5th and then we don't open until June for some reason or another and something happens that the park closes in August well now, everyone's disappointed that they bought a season pass for an X number of days and those days were taken away from them. And now we're expected to repay them the, the money that they spent rightfully. So it's just easier for everyone. If we, I know we're all excited, but there are still some kinks to work out yet. So if we can get those ironed out, I assure you there are going to be, uh, plenty of options available for uh, multi-park, multi-day season pass options in the future. Will there be a tram or something that goes between the parks? So if people get a park hopper, they can uh, navigate between them? Uh, this is a, an ongoing question, Jack, because the theme park will be charging for parking and the water park currently has free parking. And so the concern that we have is putting in place some sort of shuttle 
will incentivize more people to park at the water park and potentially overload that lot uh, when there may be people that have no interest in the theme park, but theme park guests are parking over there to avoid the charge. And so that's also probably a future amenity uh, that is, that will be miss, missing in year one. Yeah, that does um, kind of seem like something you would see on like a YouTube video on like hacks to go to Lost Island where it's, oh, you charge $10 to park at the theme park, but free to park at the water park. So park at the water park and just suck it up and walk. Which people may still do. We just don't, like I said, we want to remove the incentive to do that. And honestly, um, I don't know if any of you guys have been out there to try to walk that, but it's a mile from the, if you were to park at the, at the far north end of the water park parking lot, and walk all the way to the entrance to the theme park, you're talking about a mile one way. And I don't know that many people realize that's how far apart they are. Yeah, that's just something that like, if I spend a whole day at a theme park, you know, in the hot summer, the last thing I want to do is walk a mile to my car. So I gladly paid 10 bucks for that experience to park or 15 bucks or whatever it is, you know, to park close to the park. Yeah. Again, another question from the fan page. Jenny asks, how many rides for a two-year-old? I kind of know you You kind of touched on this already, um, but in, in my mind, you know, how many rides attractions for kids of all ages? Well, um, unfortunately, unlike the water park, where really any of the shared pools uh, that aren't a splash pool for a slide, those are considered available for children under 36 inches. At the amusement park, uh, in terms of rides, there are really only three rides there that are available for children under two. That's the carousel, the Ferris wheel, and uh, one, of the, one of the children's rides. It's a, another mini Ferris wheel uh, with an adult, but the manufacturers really don't want kids under 36 inches riding any of those other rides. However, uh, to allow for a little bit more of an interactive experience, each of the realms in the park does have a central play feature that is available for all ages and is also handicap accessible. So it's ADA uh, friendly. There is a, a jungle gym in the Tamariki realm, which is where most of the, the younger guest rides are. Then in the Udara realm, which is air focused, there's a uh, musical and uh, kinetic sculpture. So you, you sit on bicycle type uh, fixtures that as you pedal, you're able to cause the central element to spin. And then there's uh, some pipe organs, basically, that are reminiscent of something you would see at a Blue Man Group show. So uh, utilizing wind to create music and, and motion. In the water realm, Awa, we have a, a pop jet water maze that you can navigate through and not get wet to reach the center fountain. or you can choose to just run through the the spray the pop jets if you prefer and then there's a an interactive element at the middle that you'll need a few other people to activate properly in the Utah realm which is earth we have a sand play area that's got a number of items that you can discover underneath the sand and uh, some pretty amazing rock work there's a lot of amazing rock work in Utah, actually, and throughout the park. And then in the in the Murrah, the fire realm, there is a a shrine at the the base of our volcano that has a fountain feature, and there's uh, some handprints that, if you're brave enough to place them on the altar, it will reward you with uh, a variety of different effects as well. So those those elements are just uh, a, a thematic 
touch point for kids of all ages to uh, spark a sense of wonder and do something other than just riding the rides. So we, we tried to incorporate elements that, as I said, are more than just riding rides. And so even though the two-year-old may not be able to go on a roller coaster, they still will have plenty to see and touch out there. That sounds really cool, especially going back to it's more than just the rides and the thrills. It's a full themed experience. I really like that. Uh, we have another question. This person asked two questions. Uh, Thanasi asked, I hope I said that name right, what your opinion of Rocky Mountain Construction is as a company and that they would love to see one in Iowa. Well, uh, to be honest, we spoke with Rocky Mountain Construction about putting in one of the rides uh, many years ago and had one designed and everything. And the reason that we ended up moving away from it was because after talking with operators, Rocky Mountain Construction is a great company. And if you know what you're doing in the amusement industry, they are a fabulous ride to include. They're obviously, you guys know, coaster enthusiasts the world over have a real soft spot for wooden coasters. Uh, but from an operator standpoint, across the board, they are a nightmare to maintain. And getting into this with very little operational experience in the amusement industry, when we heard that and the number of people that are going to be needed just to maintain that one ride versus a steel coaster, we had to put that on a, a high shelf for future. And so it, it's, it purely came down to how much is it going to cost us to maintain this ride after building a brand new coaster that we know nothing about. Uh, and just our, our peers in the industry really advised against putting in a wooden coaster as a first attraction. So I, I will not rule out using them because we, I, I don't remember the gentleman that we talked to, but we, we spoke with the owner and uh, one of the sales guys with Rocky Mountain, as I said, met several years ago. And we, we had all but signed the papers until we realized that it was probably more than we could chew. So I guess just keep your fingers crossed that this ends up being easier for us than we're expecting. And you may see a Rocky Mountain coaster sooner rather than later. That is absolutely incredible to hear. Um, I've been an enthusiast for a long time. and RMC is one a really famous manufacturer, but it's really cool to hear from an operator's perspective how the company can function with the park. Um, of course, I got my fingers crossed as well, but that is really cool to hear. Uh, the same person asked what your favorite roller coaster in the United States was. Real simple question. Oh, man. Uh, well, <laughs> I'll be honest. Uh, the, the whole community of roller coaster enthusiasts was a surprise to learn how, how passionate as a, a group you were uh, when we got into this industry because they're water park enthusiasts but they are you guys are on a whole nother level so I was much more a themed experience guy so my the ride that really sticks with me is the Spider-Man ride at Universal Studios that was the one that really changed the game for me in terms of guest experience because it was so out of just it it was a a total it it just did not make sense that you would be able to have the sensations that you did without ever actually being on a roller coaster that's a that's a flat track ride for the most part that is that uses a de degrees of freedom vehicle like in our dark ride and there are a few uh, elevation changes that it does go through, but the vast majority of that is just tricking your eye with 3D and animatronics and moving walls. And so experiencing that in the early 2000s, it, that ride was so far ahead of its time. It still holds up if you ride that ride. There's a scene in there where you 
get thrown off of a building and you feel like you are falling, that you are in free fall. And the only thing that's happening is the ride vehicle has pitched forward a little and the screen in front of you is rushing past in 3D. And so your body says, oh my God, I am falling to my death. And then Spider-Man shoots out a web that catches you on that screen and you you stop abruptly. And that, you know, it was just the first time that I experienced that thought that this is the future of themed entertainment. And so I, uh, I kind of dodge your question a little bit because uh, roller coasters have caused me some equilibrium problems for a number of years. And so I haven't been on a roller coaster other than Dueling Dragons uh, in Universal Studios in, God, that's been gone for a long time. So let me, uh, I, I have another answer for that, actually. Um, we were at IAPA a couple of years ago when Hagrid's uh, Wild Ride came out. And that too, I mean, as enthusiasts, you guys really get to fantasize about how fun these rides are but for operators everywhere i go now uh whether it's an amusement park or a water park all i am looking at is we could do that or they should be doing that better or you know how how long does it take them to do maintenance on this ride or how does this work and so um hagrid's wild ride was was very similar it's got seven different launch points in that ride and we had just uh, purchased the, or not purchased, we, we were about to be getting the Intamin launch coaster parts in and thinking about all of the, all of the machinery that must be necessary to execute these seven launches of your train uh, throughout that ride was incredible. And that's really all I could think about the whole ride was how, what does the mechanical room for this ride look like? It has to just be a warehouse underground. So I, I guess Hagrid's wild ride would be the, the one that comes to mind. That's, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's crazy just to see that on, to see that coaster on YouTube and uh, just to think about how how it works. And that's just from an outsider perspective too. That's not knowing what our basic coaster in comparison to that would be like. Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's a, a track change in there as well. And just, there are a lot of potential failure points in that ride that I, I it's a marvel that they were able to put it together on the, on the footprint that they did, but I, I mean, the systems that must be in place to make sure that that ride operates correctly every time, I, there's just gotta be thousands and thousands of sensors to, to make it run right. Yeah. Um, the next one I have, um, again, another fan page question here uh, from Kristen. And she would like to know if you will have scooters and strollers for rental. Yeah. Okay. Yep, both. Electric scooters and single and double strollers will be available. All right. Well, that's good to hear. I think this is our last um, fan question. TJ asks, is the park still uh, on progress or on track, I guess, uh, for a spring opening date? Uh, yes. We are still targeting the first weekend in May. Um, and the contractors are pushing hard, but as all of you guys know, the weather in spring in Iowa can be very fickle. So I, I really want to temper people's expectations that it's depending on how the next two months go, it's very possible that that date could be pushed. I mean, we're, we will be pushing everyone very hard as much as we can the next 68 days before our our uh, plan soft opening but uh just don't make any plans for the first weekend in may just yet all right and i have one last question for you here and that revolves around kind of the other side of the experience of a theme park 
I'm a foodie. So I always like to ask about food. What kind of food items could we see to be offered at the park? Well, this has been long discussion as well. I don't know if you guys read the article about Volcano Bay down in Universal Orlando when that opened, uh, but it opened to great fanfare with a very exotic menu. There were uh, black bean burgers with mango chutney salsa and uh, quinoa salad I items. Um, they had jerk chicken and like passion fruit, barbecue, barbacoa, and just items that make my mouth water. And after being open for two months, they nixed 90% of those items and went to bacon cheeseburgers and chicken fingers because no one wanted to eat those items. And so we read that and were very nervous because that was our intention as well. And so we are trying to thread the needle between uh, providing the comfort foods that people clearly uh, voted with their pocketbooks at Volcano Bay and said, we want chicken fingers and cheeseburgers when we go on vacation, none of that crazy exotic stuff, but also allowing for a little bit of variety. So uh, as an example, we, we do have some rotating pizza options like we do at the water park and we will have boneless chicken wings but we also are planning some specialty burgers that are a little bit more interesting than a, a standard cheeseburger and then we will have a coconut shrimp item there's uh some very very non-traditional theme park fair out on the thirsty voyager which is the the island bar uh that we're calling island noodles it's a uh, an egg noodle stir fry with some tropical oils and um fruits and vegetables sauteed together and uh we're partnering with scratch cupcakery they will be creating a signature half dozen mini cake dessert item. So those flavors are exclusive to Lost Island Theme Park and you can only purchase them on property. Uh, so we're, we're still fine tuning the menu. We actually get into our first kitchen, hopefully on Tuesday, uh, so we can start cooking some of this stuff up and doing some taste testing and just trying to figure out which of the which of these menu items might have to go versus staying with the old standbys but I hope Nick that we will have uh, some items once we get everything finalized that will uh, excite your palate okay that is really great um, that concludes the questions we have do you have anything else you want to touch on while we have you well yes I have I may, I mentioned earlier in the podcast, but if there is anybody out there that has some free time this summer and would be interested in working at the theme park, we are starting uh, the seasonal positions at $12 an hour and we offer a wide range of uh, perks to seasonal employees. You get free admission to both parks anytime that you're not working, uh, free food, there's exclusive uh, employee events and uh, a lot of a lot of silly uh, incentive programs that go on but we we really do need everybody that we can get we're trying to hire 350 people and so far we've gotten applications from about 35 so there's there's a lot of positions that need to be filled in order for us to make this open okay well, uh, we appreciate, again, you taking time out of your day to join us for this. Um, anybody here listening and tuning in for the very first time, 
we definitely would like you to go to our Facebook page, Iowa Theme Park Enthusiast. Um, over there, you can find a direct link to our fan page, Lost Island Fans Iowa. Um, there you would be able to join in in the conversations taking place. And again, Eric, we're really looking forward to this and excited for this um, to come. Well, happy to sit in with you guys finally. Sorry for the delay. And I am... Now that we're getting close, I'd be happy to answer any other questions that you have going forward. Thanks for listening to the Iowa Theme Park Podcast, presented by Iowa Theme Park Enthusiasts. Like, share, and subscribe to our channels to support our mission to provide you with exclusive theme park industry content.